our next talk, which is um, reinventing the discovery process with uh, Francis from Ten Square Games, who I think is just joining us now. Are you there, Francis? Hello. Yeah. I'm here. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Perfect. Um, yeah, we're, we're starting to run over a bit into your time, so I'm just going to leap out, let you get on with it. Um, people, if you do have any questions, do drop them into the Q&A or the chat window, and I'll ask them towards the end of the session. But for now, um, up to you, Francis. Perfect. Thank you for the introduction, Rick. I'm going to share you the presentation. So here we go. So yeah, uh, on behalf of Tan Square Games, I'm Francis, the UX designer for the new studio that we just opened in Warsaw a few months ago. And what I'm going to show you today is a uh, part of our journey as a new studio on how we reinvented and rediscover the discovery process. So what's the discovery process? So the discovery process is actually what enabled us to answer the big question. So the big question might be, which kind of game do we want to make? So this question is a question that every game developer faced at least once or the life. And I think we got an interesting answer, um, an alternative point of view that we want to share with all of you. So the first ingredient of this discovery process is the team. We called ourselves the Argonauts because we like to explore and experiment and aim for something innovative and different. So as a new studio, Tensor Game enabled us to have a really interesting organization and structure that enable us to experiment new methodologies of designing and brainstorming, failing because it's part of the growth, and at the same time bringing value by inserting in a common gaming design process some some kind of instruments or design thinking that usually came out from other markets. So I give an example, our team is really composed by a various amount of people that has various backgrounds, not only mobile gaming, but also casino, big data analysis, uh, workshop interaction with people and PC console games. So we believe that a big part of our knowledge is also useful for the gaming industry, despite not being directly involved in the mobile gaming. So what's the question again? How to make a game? But the real question that we want to answer is, where should we start? So this is the first obstacle that we faced. And as a studio, we decided to focus, to put our heart of the operation on the player. So we want to design with the player, creating what we call a player center studio. So we at some pillars that we envision for this kind of studio. So the first pillar is that we need to understand what are the needs that the player needs to satisfy. So for example, does he need to fill a gap or boredom? Is he kind of sad so we need to cheer him up? So those kind of needs not really related to the game are really interesting and we should totally focus on them. How existing needs are treated by other games? So for example, is already entertained by playing puzzle because he likes logic and other stuff. So we can actually see already what are the solutions that he already tried and enjoyed or maybe not enjoyed. And at the same time, as I mentioned before, we want to think outside the box. So outside this market, outside the mobile gaming, what are the needs that other things are actually targeting him? So for example, uh, he wants to be entertained. So he will use, um, streaming service, specific streaming service, so you will learn the interaction with the streaming service. So other things, e-learnings, whatever, even trending, those are all information that are still part of the player, even if you don't want to think about the player outside the game. But as a studio, we really find value in focusing on those. And at the same time, of course, as a business, we want to see if this is a self-sustainable demographic. So if there is a value, if there are players, um, we can invest on them and we can make a decision that this is the player that we want to focus on and start our operation on. So to do that, uh, I want to introduce you to a methodology that is called validation. So our team of uh, big data analysts actually created a fast validation process. So we internally pitch concepts. So we answer the question what we're doing and why we're doing and they are really supported by business scenarios and business cases. So what the, what the team brings to us, the data team is the toolkit. So we call it toolkit, but it's actually a different setup, set of tools and data that they bring to us and they can 
cross compare our information about our concept to trending on social media, for example, what movies are coming out recently. So we know exactly if this topic is going to be expiring really soon or is already passed and so on. Music and other trendings that usually you shouldn't think about game, but we still believe since we are designing around the player that this is still part of his interest. And of course, after we have this whole information, we can decide if we want to proceed with that. We have, maybe we have more than one idea and we decide when should we start them, which one should be started first and so on. Uh, but then we are talking still about having the player in the middle of our art. So who are my players? So I want to introduce you to a methodology that we use. Uh, it's really using other design, let's say branches of Tony Gaming, uh, especially in uh, UX in other fields. So personas. Personas is a methodology that we really invested on. And the goal of it is to focus exactly on reaching and interacting with the right player. What does it mean persona? So I give you a super fast overview. So personas are simply talking fictional characters. So you give them a name, you give them an age, a gender, a nationality, and you build on it. Like you're building a character for a book, right? You give him a job, you give him a background of history of family and so on. So what's the goal of building this fictional character? You can, write, uh, you can ask the right question. So again, I give you an example. It's way easier to design or talk about something if you're referring to a person that you know, that you can visualize with a face and a name, despite talking, okay, let's make a game for 25 years old player European. I mean, this is so vague. And with the personas, you can actually start to think, okay, Michael really likes to play this kind of thing in the evening. So it's really more direct. At the same time, we can understand the needs, the dreams and the pain points. I will go back to this point later, but we really need to think what are the things that he's suffering for. Maybe are things that we totally need to avoid because he, may, he, will, he or she will be super angry when you will face those things in a game. Or maybe we can make something that might bring some relief on his needs, on his dreams. So this is a good point. Another big chunk of benefits of the personas are avoiding general assumptions. So assumptions are really a bad thing. Uh, it's because assuming something uh, is not really supported by data because assumption is really bad specifically if you want to target players. If I assume that a player will play just a specific kind of game because of his gender, it's wrong because people, trans, they pass. Every month there are new changes, new behaviors on the people, even our personas we need to interview them from time to time because as I said, outside the game, there is a life going on and we need to be updated with their life. So general assumption is usually something that we want to avoid and will make us our game, our design quite more organic and uh, built around the player. And of course we need to target the right audience because if exactly find those personas in on real people, so let's say we find uh, base of 100 players that we can test and they exactly fit the personas, it's way better than throwing the test to 1,000 people and only 20 of them are the players that we are designing for. This is way more interesting in our opinion and at the same time it will make us focus more in the design. So as a business then when you have the personas you, you cross check it with the market landscape so you can actually check where the motivation and the expectation overlap. Uh, when the person, where the personas and the revenue are distributed in the market. So we can find value for the business. We can find value in specific genre because personas can play different genre. I want to remember that persona can be you, so we can have different range. And of course we can decide which kind of investment we want to make. Maybe we want to see a niche in the market that we want to push in. Maybe we see big players in a market and we want to avoid them because we don't have the resources. It depends exactly on the structure and on your goal as a team. So we had a partnership with 12 Treats and 12 Treats is a big company that treats personas and they managed to create amazing um, overview and dashboards about those personas. So I'm going to share you exactly what we do. So how we work with them, so with 12 Threads is that we bring them a target market. So it means that we gather information about the market that we want to tackle. So for example, we give them a subgenre or we give them 
a really vague kind of uh, list of games that we want to analyze. And once uh, we give them to 12 traits, they are able to create a dashboard of personas, which tackles exactly real people that will be divided in personas, which are the exact audience. I'm going to give you an example just to tackle a little what they're going to do. So when you have a trait, when you have personas, you can actually maximize the design. So the design is really focused on the user. So the initial look, when you design it, which is really important for mobile games, the first seconds of the game, we can directly answer the question that the persona will ask our player. What's my goal? What do I get if I play this game? And by knowing their needs, we can actually provide them a correct initial look. Same thing for the mechanics, the core mechanics. We can design exactly mechanics that resonates with their personality, that they can play, that they are able to understand instantly, and then they are able to enjoy at the same time. We can add secondary mechanics because some players can multitask and we can analyze them by analyzing the traits of the personas. And then long-term commitment, how do we do? How do we manage the retention? So maybe we can push on the pain points of the persona by bringing some relief in the long term so the player will feel pleasure in keep playing our game and, and so on. So I give you again what kind of traits we are going to show. So this is just one of the multiple traits that uh, 12 traits bring to us. So this is the competitiveness. So the competitiveness is really divided in different things. So we have avoidant, com competitive effectivity. As you can see, the personas are divided in a big group called all players, with, which is an average of the five players that are there. So by giving them a list of games or a subgenre, they exactly track down a whole group of persona that can be divided also in five different persona. As you can see, they're really different, those, those personas. So they, some of them can be really independent while some of them can uh, be totally dependent. Some of them really like competitiveness and so on. So you can actually even start to be more precise. You can tackle only one or two personas of the group because the rest is not really bringing value to the gameplay that you're investing on. So how do you want to use the traits outside, uh, outside analyzing them? So once we bring those data, so imagine this is just competitiveness. We have way a lot of other stuff like health, dreams, pain points, focus, goals, and so on. So we can actually use them in, a, in different ways. So for example, if I tackle the values and we discover that family is a big value for them, we can decide that we need to build a co-op mode or add friends to my list to play together. If in the personality we see that is really impulsive, we can actually push to putting timers in the game because he will jump into the action as soon as he sees something like a timer or a countdown. We can actually put some glowing offers because it will attract it and he will tap it instantly because he's a person that's really impulsive. Or if we tackle the motivation, we can see that it's really flexible and he can really easily accept changes or variation of the game so we can actually test if we want to introduce new features in the game and we shouldn't be afraid because one of the core motivation is flexibility and so on. Apart from the design, using 12 traits and the personas are really useful for other things. I give an example, art style. So instead of pushing a cool art that you think is trendy, you, you can actually test the art style with the persona directly. So what we did was to draw exactly the same environment, so a house, a tree, and a character, in five different styles. And we send them to those personas, and the average told us that this, is the, this specific art style is the most liked, and the one below is the one that we should totally avoid. So we actually understood it exactly directly without losing any time what kind of art style we shouldn't invest in. And then we can move on specifically to the persona. So each art style can be really focus on a specific persona. And actually this is just the tip of the info that 12 traits provide us. You can actually also see which of those art style is really noisy for them, which of them is bringing them calmness, which of them is really distracting them, which of them is really better for the game, but they would like it more for the promo or something like that. So, so on and so on, you can dig, dig in. So why we are reusing personas, why we think is really valuable. So the, we have of course any benefits apart from the one that I told you. So we can actually target directly the needs of our players by having those insights. So those are not data, those are not assumptions, those are data. You can treat them really as data, as numbers. 
then we can actually create real actions that can enhance the experience because as designers and uh, with the partnership with Paltrace, we can actually think about specific gameplays that can tackle specific needs. And we have a, this methodology had a big impact for our team. So we are a better team because we are aligned. We design exactly talking about the same people, the same personas in our head, in our heart. We are faster because we don't lose time by testing stuff and reiterating because we are faster. And then we also have better metrics. So before launching the game, we already have a solid base of foundation that can support our idea. So how to make the right game? So as I showed you before, the innovation, where does it stand for in our studio? So as Argonauts, we believe that the core of the operation is our validation process that enables us to expand and test. So Personas is just one of the tools that uh, is in our toolkit of methodologies. Uh, we have design sprint, we have art and themes testing and so on. And we are going to introduce even more toolkits for this expansion. And then we can deep dive. So we deep dive by providing specific prototypes. So maybe we prototype with video, we prototype slice prototype, our whole F2E prototype and so on. Depends on the concept because each game has different needs. Depends on what do you want to test and what kind of test do you want to do with the personas that we are trying to do. But this is just a small fraction of innovation. So in the big picture, uh, as a company, as a studio, of course, we have the whole structure of ideation and market support that support our ideas as a business case. And of course, the evaluation and the iteration should come from us. I give an example. So we evaluate even after we get all the data, if we want to continue with this idea or not, it's up to us. And it's up to us on how we want to be creative and use those personas in many different ways. So we are still exploring. Iteration, what does it mean? After you analyze the personas in the market, maybe you realize that the game that you initially pitch is not really working so much, but you really like the persona. So all the research, the data, the art style that you tested and you got a, a result, it will not be wasted. You can still use it to make another game because personas are personas. It means those are real people. They have a wide range of games. So you can design totally another game without losing all the research that you made and you can still have all the valuable information from the beginning. And then we can decide. Uh, we can decide all together if we want to invest on those ideas if you want to kill them and if you want to reiterate them. It's a pretty iterative process and we believe that this is uh, just the beginning of our, of our whole journey as a, as a new team, as an Argonaut. So as I mentioned before, this studio is really newly open and we are really happy about the results that we are bringing to you. So what are the next milestones of our studio? So first thing, we will expand this whole process of design not only for the first concept, but also for the whole journey. It means that we are going to tackle also soft launching, global launching, live ops, and so on. We want to keep personas always on the focus, not only when you design the game at the beginning. So we want to expand our expertise. Of course, we, as I mentioned before, we have various expertise and backgrounds and we are tackling the goal to be more curious and tackle other experts to have collaboration with us, other studios, other companies to share knowledge, other people, if they want to join our team, we can have discussion about that. And fast validation of new ideas. We don't want to be stuck in one idea at the time that will take years. Ideas have an expiration window frame. So we want to be really fast, the faster that we are, but still super optimized, the better ideas we will have. And we want to make a really tailor-made UX experience for the whole game. So using personas will be just the first step, but we want to design with the player, having workshop with them and so on. And of course, smart prototyping, as I mentioned before, each prototypes for each idea will have a specific focus. So maybe one idea will want to resonate more about the mood and feel. So we will do a video prototyping. Some ideas have, are just like other games, but have a specific mechanics that differentiate us from all the other games. So maybe we want to just as the specific mechanic. So we are doing also this kind of smart prototyping that enable us to be more innovative and edgy in the market. And yeah, so this is just, as a, the title mentioned, is just the tip of the iceberg. And this is just the beginning of the journey, but we are really glad of the results that we got. And I was really glad to share these things with you today. So this is my email. If you want to connect with us, feel free. 
and I really thank you for the attention. Give it back to you, Eric. Yep. Yes, thank you. Uh, that was a really interesting talk. Um, definitely interesting to hear about the the that idea of personas and, and building up your your idea of the 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 market before you you go out there. And um, actually, that kind of leads sort of into my first sort of question that I have. Um, and if you, anybody in the audience has any more questions, please do drop them in the Q and A. So we've already got one, and we'll get to you shortly. Um, so I was kind of wondering, like. How early on do you start looking at personas when you're sort of looking at working on a game? Like, do you do do you identify a market you want to make a game for, or do you are you starting working on a game and then going, okay, now we want to send this to a certain, we want to see who this is going to work for and tailor it to them? Exactly. So there are different methodologies for this kind of process. So as a new team, we introduce the personas as a methodology really in an early stage. So at the beginning. As a guinea pig of our studio, we had a specific expertise and idea supported by market and case studies. And we had an idea of the players, but it was really vague. So with the support of 12 traits, we targeted exactly the personas after we had the initial pitch of the idea. Mm. After that, we actually were able to redefine the current pitch. But what we are doing now is exactly as I mentioned before, once you have the personas, you can decide if you want to use them for other games, or maybe you, your intuition tells you that you want to target total different games. And uh, this is another process, as you mentioned before, it, it can actually work. You can introduce personas after you focus. You, can, you need at least an input that is really strong. Could be mm -hmm. a genre, a subgenre, or some, let's say, trending games that have something in common. You can already deliver those to build a persona. Of course, the more you put as an input, the more precise it will be. But is a thing that you can actually put in early stage as long as you have at least a strong base because it's a, it's an investment though, having those research. So you shouldn't start exactly with those, but it should be a thing that you should have in the first weeks. Sure. Um, and so I know a lot of the people who come to this conference are from like small one man, two man teams or so on. Do you think it's a, is it still a viable option for these kind of small indie teams to invest uh, their time into the building the personas and identifying the market like this thoroughly? I really believe that this is, a, this is a good opportunity. Also because I think that Personas is a way, I'm talking as UX designer, not only for the gaming industry, as UX designer in general. Mm -hmm. uh, Personas is a methodology that really helped us uh, as UX designer in early stages. And even if you don't have the support of big data, having at least an idea of the needs of the player made may uh, allow you as a small studio to find the niche that you want to insert your game in. It's about finding the right slides because there is, there is also the big market with big competitors, but if you have the opportunity to find something that other companies don't want to invest in because it's a specific niche, maybe you can make, let's call it the indie game, but really targeted for a specific uh, mechanic and persona. And I, I found this way interesting even for small studios because they can actually try those uh, really interesting out of the box mechanics, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, we do have a couple of questions from the audience and uh, if you are yep. watching, please do throw them in. Uh, we've got an anonymous attendee who would like to know, how do you market test colors used in UI? Have you tried A-B tests for different colors and noticed that a specific color palette does better? Okay, so it depends exactly on uh, how do you want to do that. So. We have, of course, normal A-B testing that we do with different color palettes, or you can also say uh, color is a hard topic because it really depends on the specific outside of the person and on the device, actually, that you're playing with. So it's not really that specific. But if we want to broad the topic on art at this point, uh, personas are really useful if you don't have an idea of the art and you just have different really different from each other styles and it's really vague but you want to focus in and you already know that you have a target and you go, should go on with it but for more generic let's say i have already a style i have already a theme and i just want to test if color a is better than color b a b testing that we're doing can be actually as i mentioned before those personas provided by 12 trades are real people they are just divided in those clusters but we can take those colors red color red one red two and test exactly with those people and we can check them. But again, as I mentioned, I think color is really more uh, physical condition. So 
but art can be tested with those specific people and you can be really precise in this case. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I guess you've got to take in, particularly with colors, you've got to take into consideration like color blindness and, and making exactly. sure that everybody is able to see them. Um, yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Um, uh, we've got a question here. Has there been a time where the insights from personas turned you to the wrong direction? And if so, how did you handle that? Oh, yeah. It wasn't that they turned us to the wrong direction. So, personas are like human beings, they give you a big amount of data so a lot of things that you might need or not need so it depends so sometimes uh, personas made us uh, think that there is a specific mechanic and it was really that we wanted to focus on and that was uh, a big pro uh, at the same time uh, as i mentioned before before tackling personas we already started the concept before tackling them and we had some misconcept as I mentioned before of something related to those players and we already designed something that we realized later that was wrong was the wrong focus so personas get us to the right track the opposite way getting us to from the from the other track is depends on how you read it so in our way we try to design each mechanic and each feature seeing the peaks of the traits we don't consider all of them some of them are average we just consider when someone is really give an example is really independent, is really competitive, or someone doesn't really like um, team play. Those things can actually uh, be our main focus, while if we start to focus on all the traits and try to build exactly the game that makes us uh, track all the cases, even the one that really average, this will make us lose, I will not say track, but time. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, we are talking about being efficient and, and uh, being really fast in a in a good way, so we are learning how to read exactly the right data on it, and it's really useful, I think. Cool. Um, and we've got a question here from Giovanni, um, and maybe we can sort of figure this one out. I'm not entirely sure uh, what <laughs> the the question is here. Um, from market intel to ideations or pitching sessions, how close is the scope, and how do you conduct the ideations? Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. So. Yeah, from ideation and market intel. So it's the step before uh, the persona. So exactly when we do the pitching, we just don't do pitching because we have an interesting idea. Of course, that should be part of it and uh, interest and passion about it, of course. But we have exactly a really cool team of data analysts that has experience on big data. And we try to focus, of course, our internal market uh, team in, uh, in TSG is really supporting us in provider, providing us the data that we need so we can build exactly a study case on that. What our data analysts are doing, that is uh, an extension of that, is providing us the innovation curve, I call it like that. So they can find exactly the, the curve where there is going to be a bubble that is not going to explode soon or when there is, where the trendings are going to aim for. I give an example. Maybe soon there will be the time for sci-fi because of cyberpunk or Dune coming. And may, do we want to invest in this? Maybe it's too, it's too late because you need one year to develop it and in one year everything will be over. So those kind of things are really uh, the edge of the innovation data analyst that we have, but the, the whole process before it really, is really supported by big data about gaming, mechanics, and analyzing exactly where the market is investing and which games are trending and uh, which mechanics are differentiating them between each other. So yeah, there is a big support before. And then, yeah, we are free based on those data to build different concepts and validate them. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, right. I think that's really all we have time for because our next speaker is here and ready. But thank you so much, Francis. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm sure they can reach out to you through Meet to Match and, and so on. And you're going to be around for the rest of the conference. Okay. Thank yeah. you, everyone, for attending. And thank you, Rick, for the warm introduction and cooperation. So... Yeah, feel free to contact me and I'm really glad to be here and bye and enjoy the rest of the event, everyone. Awesome. You too. Thanks very much for joining us.